In the previous video, we discussed how the capitalist imperialist system developed over the past century. Today, in the current phase, we will discuss its four main characteristics, as laid out by Pao Yu Ching in the highly recommended book, Lenin's Imperialism in the 21st Century, published by the Institute of Political Economy. Pao Yu Ching describes four characteristics of the current phase of imperialism as 1. The hegemonic status of the U.S. dollar and U.S. domination in international finance. 2. The internationalization of production and accumulation. 3. The interconnectedness of the global capitalist class. And 4. The unresolvable and deepening contradictions between the capitalist state and its people. Let's go over these characteristics. Welcome to the Peace Report, an anti-imperialist media outlet. Support our content by subscribing, clicking the like button, and sharing the video. The Hegemonic Status of the U.S. Dollar and U.S. Domination in International Finance The most important feature of this new phase of imperialism was the hegemonic status of the U.S. Dollar and U.S. Domination in Global Finance. Dollar hegemony has meant that the United States, as a debtor country, can continue to run deficits in trade and an overall international balance of payments. As debt piles up in the U.S., the U.S. dollar became the international currency of the world. It is now the medium of exchange, the unit of value, and the store of value for all countries, and it is the main form of foreign exchange reserves in central banks. This dollar hegemony is the backbone of U.S. hegemony in economic, political, and military power of the U.S. imperialist state. Lenin explained the power of finance capital during his time, but he had no idea how powerful it would become by the end of the 20th century and thus far in the 21st century. Neoliberalism beginning in the 1970s unleashed the power of finance capital. The liberalization and deregulation of financial institutions and transactions during the neoliberal globalization have freed financial capital from government regulations. Global U.S. dollar reserves have grown from $1 trillion in the 1980s to over $10 trillion today. All of it is U.S. debt. With every financial crisis, and with the U.S. dollar being as fluid as printed paper, it gained the capacity to shift various crises from one part of the world to another, as we've seen from the crisis in Latin America in the 1980s, in East Asia in the 1990s, and the most recent global crisis of 2007 and 2008. These crises become worse, the U.S. dollar becomes stronger. The Internationalization of Production and Accumulation First, what does it mean to internationalize production and accumulation? Basically, it means to break up the production process into many small parts with different production sites in different countries. A phone, computer, or automobile, but also agriculture, healthcare, and even entertainment is produced in several countries. It has been globalized. Global monopoly capital determines how this production is divided, not the country that actually produces it. This is why a country in Africa can produce more than enough rice, but its people would be in poverty and starvation with no rice at all. These countries are completely dependent on the rules set by the imperialist countries, which dictate how everything is produced as well as where the profit goes. Neoliberalism in the imperialist core pushed oppressed nations, or developing nations, to deregulate, liberalize, and privatize their resources. This forced developing countries to open up their borders to foreign goods, investment, and high-interest loans. These countries fell into deep debt, leading them to accept the unfair conditions set by monopoly capital and imperialist states via the IMF and the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs or else they would risk defaulting on their loans. All of this created export-led economies in poor countries and provided the necessary conditions for the internationalization of production and accumulation. 
To test this model of an export-led economy, four countries were chosen, Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore. These countries are now labeled as democratic or economic miracles. Yes, they did industrialize very fast, but in reality, they are all countries with extreme inequality, among various other problems no society should be proud of. For instance, out of all the OECD countries, South Korea had the highest suicide rate for 10 consecutive years from 2002 to 2012, and has competed as the highest rate almost every other year for the past 10 years. Wherever capitalism goes, horrible things are to follow. Multinational corporations forced these countries to develop export-led economies and created global value chains. They used structural adjustment programs and institutions like the IMF and the World Bank to hack the global capitalist system to work in favor of the imperialist core, further exploiting and oppressing poor countries. The capitalist imperialists created the most favorable conditions for themselves in poor countries. Relaxed environmental and labor regulations, privatized resources, developed infrastructure not owned by the poor countries, and forces all the poor countries to compete with each other to provide the lowest wages, taxes, and least restrictions on foreign ownership and profit repatriation. And let's remember the first characteristic, U.S. dollar hegemony, which helped a whole lot with the internationalization of production and accumulation. The interconnectedness of the global capitalist class. In every poor country, there is somewhat of a national bourgeoisie. Before neoliberalism, it was possible for revolutionaries to build relationships with their national bourgeoisie in order to build a united front against imperialism and they played a big role in national liberation movements. After all, these were capitalists who wanted to be rich in their own country. But today, these national capitalists are more connected and dependent than ever before to global monopoly capitalism. In this current phase of imperialism, capitalists in developing countries have given up any attempt to develop their economies independent of the global monopoly. Instead, they are working closely with Global Monopoly to get a share of profits in the internationalization of production and accumulation. The room for negotiation between global capitalists and the capitalists in developing countries is getting smaller, because the rules about how to conduct international business have been largely institutionalized. Although capitalists in developing countries have been forced to share the markets and profits with Global Monopoly capital, they have been rewarded handsomely. Pao Yuching goes on to say, Therefore, these capitalists of different nationalities are no longer national capitalists in their countries as defined before this current phase of imperialism. They will not stand with the working class in their struggles against imperialism. The book that this quote comes from does not go into further detail about the decline of national capitalists around the world. I wish they did. But to learn more about this, I found the work of William I. Robinson to be of interest. Although I may not agree with everything he says, his work does have useful ideas in this regard. Robinson studies the transnationalist capitalist class, or TCC. What is the transnational capitalist class? A transnational capitalist class emerged as the manifest agent of global capitalism, about which much has been written in recent years. The leading sectors of national capitalist classes have experienced integration with one another across borders in a process of transnational class formation. Its interests lie in promoting global rather than national markets and circuits of accumulation, in competition with local and national capitalist groups whose fate is more closely bound with their particular nation states. This transnational capitalist class is the hegemonic fraction of capital on a world scale. It is made up of the owners and managers of the giant transnational corporations and the financial institutions that drive the global economy. The unresolvable and deepening contradictions between the capitalist state and its people. 
In every capitalist society, there lies a capitalist class as the main driving force of the capitalist state. In developing countries, the capitalist state must facilitate capital accumulation in service to imperialism. The states of developing countries compete with each other to bring in foreign and imperialist investment. These developing countries must be able to push wages and benefits to the lowest possible level, turn a blind eye to safety issues in the workplace, and prevent any labor organizing that would disrupt production. These states must compete to have the weakest environmental regulations and ignore water, ground, and air pollution. These strategies and tactics are as old as capitalism itself. The new aspect of this is that developing states are competing with each other in carrying out the oppression of labor and exploitation of the environment to an extreme in order to be chosen as a production site in the long global supply chain. This contradiction is only deepening within the capitalist imperialist system. These are the four characteristics of the current phase of imperialism as laid out by Pao Yu Ching in the book Lenin's Imperialism in the 21st Century. This book is highly recommended to read in order to understand imperialism in the past century and where it stands today. We can't have an understanding of the capitalist imperialist system without understanding these four characteristics and its development. Thanks for watching the Peace Report. Listening to people see what they think And combine that with what we say Cause I want them to play what we sing And then sing what they want to relay Cause I be sipping coffee in the morning Cause revolution ain't no fucking tea party